Thank you very much. It's a huge honor to be here, not only in representation of my country, Chile, and my university, but also in representation of all Latin American, especially Latin American women. These are my affiliations, and these are my potential conflict of interest. And what are we going to talk about? In the, last, in the few minutes, we're going to talk about why we need new drugs. Do we really need new drugs? Why we need new treatment strategies? That is not exactly the same as new drug. So far, we have many, many good drugs. As Dr. Yes said, one pill a day, most of our patients, our patients are undetectable. And we know, on the other hand, that developing a new drug, it's very expensive, take a lot of time between 12 to 15 years, many, many million of dollars. You start with 10,000 molecules and you finish up with one drug that's going to be massive available. So do we need more effort, considering that we have so far very good drugs? And this is the HIV drug timeline. We start on 1987, sorry, with Cetovudine, the very first HIV drug. And we move through all this year, almost 40 years, and we already have 34 drugs available plus two booster. And this moment we have 22 drugs available plus two booster. All those uh, many drugs were already uh, discontinue to use because they're very toxic or have a lot of adverse effects. But at that moment, when they were released, were the only option for our patients. So we have a very strong uh, armamentarium of drugs. And if we see the life expectancy of our patients living with HIV, and we compare in this very interesting study for Marcus from the year 2020, he compares a huge number of people living with HIV, 39 thousand, matched one in 10 with people without HIV. And you can see here, like over the years, the expectancy, the life expectancy is very close. And this is a very good study because, and as, as unusual, you can see Asian, Blacks, Latino, White, MSM, heterosexual IV dry users. So a lot of different population and the result is almost the same. And the best part is that if you do your diagnosis early and you start treatment before the CD4 drops 500, there is no difference in the life expectancy, even if you are HIV, living with HIV or living without HIV. And I love this picture. And I believe one picture is worth a thousand words. And I want to ask all of you a question. And please answer to me. Can you raise your hand? How many of you need to take a pill every single day for anything? Hypertension, diabetes, thyroid, HIV. There are, I don't see a lot because there's a lot of light. But many of you raise your hand. OK. And now. Raise your hand, how many of you really take your pills every single day and don't forget your pills? I'm not. Every time I travel, every time I travel to the other side of the world, I have 14 hours of difference, I forgot my hypertension pills. Don't feel bad because this happened to everybody. So if we go to this other study in 2020, again, from De Los Rios, and again, I like, I like this study because you can see people from North America, Europe, Latin America, Asia, Australia, and South Africa. You can see the different reasons why people living with HIV are not taking their pills, and they are forgetting and not having 100% of adherence. Some of them are different between different regions, but the most important are because they were bored of taking pills every day and make a, every day have to remember the AHAV positive because they have to take a pill, or many mental issues felt depressed or overwhelmed or simply forgot because they were too busy most of the time working or just living a life or falling asleep. So very simply reason. So definitely we need to do more so our patients get a more friendly treatment. So yes, more treatment options are needed for different reasons, social reasons, privacy, convenience, for psychological reasons, this pill fatigue that I already mentioned, anxiety, depression, or many mental issues. This HIV constant reminder of taking a pill, I am, have this disease, I don't want to have this disease, I need to take this pill every day, but also biological, that could be very important too, swallowing problem, adverse effect, drug-drug interaction, what is very important because our patients are getting older, so they need more drugs. 
So if we're going to create new drugs, and definitely it seems that we need new drugs, what are the ideal characteristics of those new drugs? They need to be affordable, and that's a huge thing, because they're not going to be good drugs. It's only a handful of countries or very rich country can pay for that. We need drugs that can be available everywhere in the world. Of course, drugs need to be safe. That, is the, that can work for people with resistant HIV variants or people with long treatment history, and they need to be convenient or friendly, uh, one pill a day or one injection a month, but we need to give our patients a lot of options. Of course, there is many researchers working in cure and in prevention in terms of vaccine I am not going to talk about, so I am going to focus at the, in what new drugs need to be affordable, safe, and convenient. So the challenges for new compounds that are being created, that are being in the pipeline, it seems to be that long-acting HIV drugs. I don't want to take a pill every single day. I would like to have any kind of treatment for all the disease that you raise your hand that is not a pill every single day. But we also need to study those new drugs in groups of people that are historically neglected. What happened with pregnant women, with kids, with elder, with people with high VMI, or with different characteristics. So the new drug must be studied in all kind of group. And Finally, our patients and also the prescribers need a lot of options. It's not that one pill a day is the best for everybody. People want to choose, and today we have the technology so people can choose. So these are the breakthrough in HIV treatment. We start with ACT in 87, was the very first drug. A couple of years later, dual therapy that we knew very uh, quickly that it was not good enough because there was a rebound in viral load. But the real big change started in 95 with the release of protease inhibitors and what we call heart at that time, highly active retroviral therapy. And this changed definitely the expectancy of life of our patient. They stopped dying because we are giving them a very good treatment that at that time have a lot of adverse effects, was a lot of pills, but at least was working, was efficient. 2006, single tablet regimens, a huge change, one pill a day. Can it get it better? Yes, because integrase inhibitor in 2007. And at that moment, we realized that these drugs were more safe with less interaction, um, much more comfortable. And now we're talking about long acting drugs, a new breakthrough in HIV treatment. Let's remember the treatment goals. The most important goal, of course, is to reduce mortality and morbidity, and we reach that goal. With the current drugs, we have, as I showed you already, an excellent life expectancy. Of course, improve quality of life. I tell all of my patients that if they take their pills and they have gear adherence, they can do whatever they want. They can be an astronaut, a diver, a physician, whatever they want. Ideally, with minimal adverse effects and a few interactions with other drugs, because they're getting older and need other drugs, reestablish immune and preserve function. Of course, achieve total viral suppression because that is going to not only help that patient, also to decrease in transmission and go to what we already know as U equal U. So let's go again on long acting. What do you mean or what do we mean with long acting? Andrew Owen in 2016 gave this definition. If we're going to talk about long acting, more than one week for oral treatment, more than one month or more for injectable, or more than six more for implantables. But these things, this long acting is not new for HIV. We are not the one who are discovering or using this technology for the first time. For the ID physicians here in the room, we all know very well benzatine penicillin, our best friend for syphilis, that's a long acting drug, and there are many others. And you can see here that the indication goes from a lot of uh, hormonal treatments and schizophrenia or different mental disease. So long acting or standard release is a technology that had been used for a while. 
And if we go to drug delivery system, because one thing is that we need this new drug that lasts long, but we also need a delivery system that can deliver the drug in a small, in a more uh, relent pace to our patients. And there are different technologies. Gastric residence device, that's a pill that you can keep in your stomach for a week or so. Vaginal rings that we already know from PrEP. Implants that I'm going to talk a little bit more, like also microarray that I'm going to talk a little bit more. Injectable drugs that now are the most famous, but not the only option. BNAPs and wearable infusion pumps, for example, like insulin that kids use when they have diabetes. They can also be used, or they've been working to be used in HIV. But all these drawings are not just in the imagination of crazy scientific genius, they are real. They're in different uh, phases of development, and you can see vaginal range. This is the, the wearable, the, the thing that you, drink, you uh, swallow and keep in your stomach for a while. Here you see the patches, and here you can see other patches and the implants. So these are real things. So there are new opportunities for the long-acting antiretroviral therapy, and of course, like in everything in life, there are challenges. Less frequent dosing, avoiding this pill fatigue. Our peoples are fed up of taking pills every day. But bioavailability, 100%. Of course, we are hoping for less adverse effect and less drug interaction. Protect the, healthy, uh, pri the health privacy of our patients, reduce stigma, and hopefully improve adherence. That's why we're doing all this. Of course, there are challenges that we need to address. What happened, there is big, large infusion volumes that you cannot get 20 ml, for example, in an intramuscular injection. What happened if every patient need or not need an oral lead -in? Management of missing dosing, that patient that never show up, or coverage of the tail. Or what happened if, if with the patient, it's already with this long acting, develop resistance or have drug, drug interaction or have serious adverse effect. And finally, as always, we still don't know what happened with pregnant and children. Let me talk very few, just two slides about these other technologies, implants. We already know them from contraceptive uh, treatments. For example, they are removable. They are predictable in terms of drug release. The PK is independent of the site of action and they're very good things and they can last very long time, even years. The cons is that you need a professional that is going to make a very small surgical procedure, but still you need a healthcare worker. Uh, if it is not bioadorable, it needs to be removed. The problem is this technology is expensive. What it makes it not very interesting for generic brands. So again, only a few part of the world population maybe can access and have this double regulation as drug and device. Transcutaneous microneedle patch, fantastic idea. It's removable, it's a patch, it's easily placed. The own patient can do it or someone close to the patient. The duration is shorter but can be days to week. But so uh, limited uh, amounts of drug can be used in this technology. It's complex to manufacture it and that means it's expensive. And again, when it's expensive, no, no more interest for generic brands and have again this double regulation from the uh, agency that make it more difficult. Let's move now to the new, because we already have, as you know, long-acting drugs and the future drugs in the pipeline. And this is a little bit busy uh, slide, but here you can see the replication cycle of HIV and where different drugs act in different uh, stages. So in the pipeline here, you can see different families that have been developing new treatment. And if you wanna start looking for what is coming in the pipeline, I definitely recommend this pipeline reform from TAG. They, this was released, I don't know if yesterday or today, but they sent it to me. I am very grateful a couple of weeks ago. This is a very good way to start looking for what is coming in the pipeline. So the drugs that are already approved, we know long-acting cabotegravir, alranipivirin, it's intramuscular, can be every four or each week, safe, tolerate with virological control, with or without oral lead-in. 
Uh, as you know, it's sweet for people, patients living with HIV that are already undetectable. It's approved by the FDA, EMA, the European FDA, and many other agencies, and it's already on the guidelines of the HHS, European guidelines, and UK guidelines. On the other hand, lenacapavir, it's subcutaneous every six months, but pay attention because this is for multidrug resistant uh, HIV needs to be together with oral treatment. So it's not an injectable that goes alone. It's an injectable plus daily pills. It's also approved by the FDA and MAA, and it's in the guidelines of the HHS, EAX, and BIBA. And this table, I know it's very busy, but what I want to show here is there are many drugs in the pipeline in different phases, one, two, and three, but we're thinking about long acting, but we are not only thinking in injectable long acting. There are many other options, as I already told you, pills. There are new studies that are showing that people pre prefer one pill a week instead of getting an injection one once a month. So there are more things to come. And in the further future, we are not only talking about injections every two months, we are talking about injections maybe once a year. There are a lot to come because this study has been done so far only in mice and monkeys, but we are talking a year-long extended formulation, nanoformulated cavotegravir, but also drugs that we know a little bit much better, like dolutegravir or tenofovir that can last one year. So in the future, much better things are coming. I'm going to talk a couple of words of lenacapavir that, as you all know, it's already approved for um, heavily treated patients. This is a new kind of drug, a capsid inhibitor, new class with activity in different stages that make it very potent. The capsid protein P24 is active in very early phases, but also in late stage of the viral cycle. And as I mentioned before, it's available and it's approved, but it's available in a few countries because of the cost in just some, pay, some countries for heavily treated patients. But there are some studies that are being running at this moment, like the Calibrate study that is testing lenacapavir in naive patients. I'm not going to describe the details of the study, but you can see it's an ongoing phase two, randomized open label. Uh, the patients are, are naive, as I already told you, with viral low over 200 copies and CD4 over 200 uh, CD4 cells. And they are testing lenacapavir in different combinations, subcutaneous every 26 weeks. And you can see here the first results and they look very, very optimistic. Domestic. Islatravir, that's a, a, a drug that we are being hearing for a while. We all know that it was stopped for a while because the drop in CD4. It's a drug of a new generation of nukes, nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. It's a little bit difficult to say. It's very powerful, multiple mechanisms of action that blocks translocation and also prevent nucleated incorporation in case of translocation. It has been studied first as PrEP, long-acting PrEP, but that was put on hold. And now there are some studies uh, with Islatrovin for daily and also for weekly dose. So it's safe by using lowered oral dose, 0 0.25 milligrams per daily dose or 2 milligrams for weekly dose. And in what concerned to this presentation, two study reported of new delivery formulations, a bioerodable subcutaneous implants, that is great because you don't need to take it away, or a refillable titanium implant, that means that you can refill it and, long, and have it for a long, long time. This is very interesting, this study. It's a combination of islatravir with lenacapavir that is already released. And this study is going to finish the experimental phase at the end of the year. So hopefully next year, hopefully in this conference in Germany, we can have the first results. It's a phase two randomized and open label control study. They are uh, testing this combination of islatravir, lenacapavir against bictegravir, TAF, and FTC in people uh, living with HIV that is already undetectable for at least six months. And the results, as I told you, they're going to be available next year. But not everything goes very well in this uh, pipeline. Sometimes there are some studies and some drugs that don't finish very well. Uh, Ulon Niviride, or MK8507, 
um, was first, it's a common NNRTI resistant virus. It's a very good drug with a very long half-life, 70 hours, supports weekly overall dosing. That's what we want, weekly pills, with less CNS effects. And as you all know, in this family, CNS effects are very common. Phase one, only 18 patients work very, very well and supports weekly combination. But in the phase two, when it was combined with Islatravir, there was a drop in CD4 count, so the study is on hold. So we don't know what is going to happen, if there is going to be more study in the near future or not. And another drug that didn't came well at the end is albuburtidil, long acting infusion inhibitor, different family. It was approved in China in 2018 based on a 48 weeks data from a phase three study. And then in US there was a trial, different trials to see the maintenance therapy in suppressed viral load and for multi-drug resistance and also effects in the reservoir after that IRT interruption. The problem is that the researchers are not recording their results. So after uh, September 2021, 20, there is no more information. So the current status is unclear. And for this one, for the reservoir study, there's no updated record and the study was never listed as open for enrollment. So we, I cannot finish this talk without talking about BNAPs. In the two fantastic uh, lectures of this morning, plenary of this morning, that we heard about BNAPs. I'm not going to be explain you what they are. Uh, but we, so far, have 15 BNAPs are being studied. And in compared to our uh, long-acting antiretroviral, classic antiretrovirals, the good things from BNAPs in comparison is that they reduce toxicity, less adverse effect, and less drug-drug interaction, extended half-life at least six months in many cases, and a potential for a wider immune response. So this slide, I don't know if you see it very well, but it's a beautiful slide from Spencer in a recent publication. You can see the development of BNAP starting in the decades of the 80s, so a long time ago, has been a very long journey. You see the clouds and the rain as technology advanced, leaves at the needs of translocation research. The great spots like these ones, our cohort and patient that have been added to this equation. Roots are available BNAPs. And finally, these red apples are the therapeutical clinical use. We can see that now this tree is getting bigger, fruity, and with strong roots. And of course, it's going to get even more bigger. Broadly, BNAPs. Clinical trials generally demonstrate safety and antiretroviral activity, but we need to predict the sensitivity at baseline because not all BNAPs works for all patients, and it's still that a little bit difficult. New data include new delivery methods, as you can see here, this pouch in subcutaneous uh, treatment because it's a, it's a big amount or can be this IB uh, infusions. There's combination strategies that are being studied, phase one and phase two, with many BNAPs all together, as we listened this morning, or other studied BNAPs with long-acting antiretroviral all, all together. This study, this is very difficult to pronounce, is Lenacavavir plus TAV and SAV. That's the way I say it. It's impossible to say it. It was presented on Las Croix, phase 1B, multicenter randomized, blinded, phase 1, so you can see 21 patients and the results here to, at week 26. Lena Kapavir plus Tav and Sav sustained viral suppression in 18 out of 20 patients. This is the first time a six-month antiretroviral treatment is under consideration. Of course, there's a long way to go yet, but this is huge news. So the question, long-acting te technologies are a game changer? Yes, definitely yes, in my opinion, and probably in most opinion here in the room they are. And if you're interested in this topic, you can go to one or all of these four uh, talks of, of the, that are talking about long-acting during this conference. And yes, they are a long changer, a game changer, but there is a big but that only a handful of countries around the world have these drugs available. And you can see there are not so many. And you can see that, for example, in Africa, 
only two countries, or in Latin America, where I come from, four countries out of 35 countries. So what can we expect? More new drugs available in the near future? Yes, absolutely. New roads of administration, not only intramuscular or subcutaneous or IV. We're thinking in pills that last one week at least, injectables of different kind, depot parts, transdermal, new mechanism of action, capsid inhibitor, maturate inhibitors, and BNAPs. BNAPs are going to be a huge thing, but hopefully wide distribution and access for all who can benefit from it and not just for a few parts of the world. Thank you very much. And I cannot not acknowledge all these wise men and women of the tribe that helped me with this presentation. Thank you.